Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Tyro uh, Friday morning program. A um, little bit unusual that we've got two tumor boards back to back last, last week and this week, but um, I appreciate everybody joining in, and we've got truly an outstanding all star cast this morning. Um, and as usual, I'm going to hand the program over to Dr. Tuttle, uh, who is going to introduce everyone and uh, get us started here. And welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. So we have uh, three cases this morning that uh, I think bring up some challenging cases and some interesting cases. And I suspect we're probably not going to get a definitive answer for some of these, but they'll be uh, educational. It'll be interesting to see what people think about it. Um, as usual, I'll just go around my screen and let folks sort of introduce themselves and say hi. Uh, Peter, you're up in the top corner. Hi there. I'm Peter Sato. I'm a, an endocrine pathologist at Mass General Hospital and Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston. Thanks, Peter. Monica? Uh, I'm a nuclear medicine physician from Australia. I work at Prince of Wales and Sydney Children's Hospital, and I have an interest in thyroid disease. Awesome. Mark? Dr. Severio, i got two of you here. <laughs> Mark Severio, head and neck surgeon at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Thanks, Mark. Dr. Worth? Good morning, everyone. I'm Lori Worth. I'm a medical oncologist at Mass General in Boston. Dr. Alexander? Morning, I'm Eric Alexander. I'm an endocrinologist at the Brigham and Women's here in Boston. Perfect, Dr. Corsandi. Uh, I'm a neuroradiologist at Mount Sinai. Fantastic, wonderful. And Dr. Randolph, I'll let you introduce yourself and get us started for the morning. Yes, hi, I'm Greg Randolph. I'm an otolaryngologist at Mass Sinai and Mass General, and I'm very honored. I wanna thank Mark and thank Mike for putting this wonderful program together. And so this will be a thyroid tumor board. I appreciate also Peter Sadow, our expert pathologist. He really helped a lot with many of the slides here relating to pathology. And it's really my honor uh, to be here uh, with such a uh, elite uh, a group of panelists. So we're going to do three cases and I'm going to just kind of present the case and then Mike will take it and moderate through the panel. So the first one is a case number one, which is a case of local regionally advanced DTC. I wanna first think that when I say these are my cases, they're really our cases. We have a very, very large group of people. And I think all of us would admit that all of our activity research and otherwise is really multi-pronged and based on all of our colleagues that we work together. This is a sampling of all of the people that help to treat these patients and research the problems that these patients present. So this is a lovely 26 year old woman who came up from North, I think from uh, New Hampshire or so, and she had a four weeks of uh, right neck swelling, otherwise completely healthy. Um, she had a outside ultrasound when she came down that showed a 3.3 centimeter right thyroid nodule and an 11.5 centimeter something or other in her neck, a group of matted nodes, they thought perhaps, and she had a needle biopsy that was positive for PTC and then was referred to our practice. So Mike, Yep. So, so when we when we have these, we'll start with Eric, and then we'll go to Mark. Um, Eric, sort of, what initial thoughts when you're seeing this, and sort of, you know, what are you thinking about as we're sort of thinking out loud here a little bit? I didn't have the ultrasound. I mean, I'd say, you know, acute onset of enlargement of the anterior neck, and I'd be wondering, is there a cyst that bled? Is there some maybe even De Quervin's thyroiditis that's showing kind of a mass? Those are more common issues that would kind of acutely grow. I will say the ultrasound here, you know, that shows a, a very large uh, lymph node. So that is not a subtle, a small thing. And that kind of changes everything. And I would try and get a handle on whether the patient really feels there's been that rapid of growth. And that would lead to really concern for a very aggressive process. Yeah. Now, Mark, uh, this, uh, you know, it's a tumor board. So we all know this is going to be thyroid, but you don't always know that when people walk in your door, right? So are there... I, what, what else is going through your mind when you're looking at this uh, beyond just the, uh, the sort of typical thyroid cancer stuff, Mark? Uh, thanks, Mike. So, um, yeah, I think as, as uh, Eric mentioned, I mean, I think if, if you didn't have the, you know, the ultrasound and the biopsy, um, you would be looking at um, the possibility of some type of benign, um, you know, thyroiditis, um, of course, uh, once you see sort of the the enlargement of the significant enlargement of these lymph nodes, you're not thinking that anymore. But the other thing in this age group, I mean, lymphoma, of course, would be um, in your differential. Um, so you'd be asking the patient if they have had fevers, night sweats, 
uh, weight loss, those types of things. Okay. And Greg, tell us about your physical exam now when they get to you. Yeah, so uh, we uh, have a right uh, thyroid bed fullness. Uh, she's a fairly thin person, and you can feel it feel, felt like, uh, I, I remember it felt like a banana in her neck. There was this oblong, ovoid uh, mass that started just below her ear and extended downward into the neck. There was some lobulation to it, but it felt like one large mass. We examined her otherwise negative and her voice and vocal cord motion were normal on flexible fiber optic endoscopy. And so then the next question is, what sort of imaging would you get? She had had an outside ultrasound, but in these sorts of patients, I really never ever rely on outside imaging, especially when the findings are quite extreme on exam. I worry about the accuracy and uh, cuts of the CAT scan and so forth. So these are usually people who get you know, clean slate, new imaging here, but what, what would everyone, uh, Mike, what would you think about imaging? Ultrasound alone, what else, anything? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think when you, there, there's very little question when we have these big, lots of lymph nodes in the neck and big masses, we're gonna, we're gonna go to imaging beyond ultrasound, right? So we've all seen ultrasound underrepresented that. Uh, to Dr. Grassandi, the in some patients, uh, some centers go to MRI with contrast, other folks do CT with contrast. It seems to be very kind of center and physician specific. Is there, is there any reason to pick one versus the other when we're looking at neck and lymph nodes in the neck? I prefer CT. It's quicker. Most patients cannot stay in the scanner for that long. MRI scanners are longer. The second thing is that most of the lymph nodes for thyroid disease are lower uh, in the neck. So that's when patients are breathing and you get a lot of artifact, particularly from shoulders and breathing by the thoracic inlet. So evaluation of central compartment is much harder. Evaluation of level five and four lateral compartment neck nodes are much harder. I prefer CT. In addition, the, one, the biggest challenge with ultrasound is that they would never, you will never be able to evaluate a lateral retropharyngeal lymph node. Yeah. So that's why, especially with someone with such bulky disease, which, you know, if you don't know the first diagnosis without a biopsy in this age group would be lymphoma, you have to consider lateral retropharyngeal nodal disease. So I would go to a CT. Easy, low radiation these days with the new equipment. Yeah. Dr. Erkin, the, uh, Dr. Shaha, the young surgeon that I work with over here, he loves CT scans with contrast. That's generally what we do. I, I, it seems like you order a lot of MRIs in this setting. Uh, am I sort of dreaming that up or do you have a preference there, Mark? Uh, no, I, I would agree with Dr. Persande. Obviously, the issue remains uh, this question of uh, an iodine load um, from the contrast, but that really is uh, uh, not something that we pay much attention. The value added is significantly uh, outweighs the, uh, the delay in RAI. Dr. Alexander, should we be thinking about anything beyond the neck? We're all sort of focused on the neck with cross-sectional imaging of the neck to guide the surgery, chest, anything else that you'd be doing? I think so. I mean, just putting this in perspective, if we are dealing with thyroid cancer, I think we had a biopsy or we certainly would get one if we didn't. When you have this amount of disease, you'd be worried about distant disease as well. So um, you're kind of thinking to yourself, you have to address, diagnose what's going on in the neck. You'd be worried at the rapidity of growth potentially, but you do want to look at the lungs. Dr. Zafario, you know, a lot of times I'll see people just operate off the neck and they'll miss these upper mediastinal lymph nodes when somebody has a ton of disease in the neck like this. So in your cross-sectional imaging, do you do neck and chest, or does your neck CT see far enough down to the upper mediastinum? How, how do you think about that, Mark? Uh, thanks, Mike. So uh, typically, the neck CTs do go down and get the uh, superior mediastinum anyway, but we would definitely get a CT a, a neck and chest on this patient as as described, just because this is a you know this is a this demographic of patient uh, would suggest she's in her mid twenties that this you know is probably uh, sort of like a pediatric thyroid cancer almost that sort of um, may have been there for uh, years and even even decades um, and sort of grown you know over that time and those patients um, in addition to sort of bulky lymph node disease often have tiny little lung uh, nodules you know representing metastasis and these aren't particularly threatening they they grow you know, slowly over the years, but they're typically there. And it's a good baseline to have for the patient. Dr. Ross Mike, I, I just want to mention something, uh, emphasize something that Dr. Crossandi said, which I think is really important that there's always this debate, MR versus CAT scan. It's all about, you know, cross-sectional imaging is what we want, but that 
that blurring, that MR artifact from breathing in the neck base is that's a very big ticket item as is the readability and speed of CT scan to quickly have that information, have it re read by the surgeons who are gonna be bringing the patient to the OR. Those are really good points that are subtle, but I think uh, trump the MRI scan in the setting of uh, getting a quick and easily read CAT scan. We're very good points. Yeah, Dr. Rossley, before we move on to look at the imaging, 26-year-old um, papillary thyroid cancer at some point, is there is there any role for other nuclear medicine imaging here, or we're just starting down the pathway with the CT scans uh, as you're thinking about this one, Monica? I don't think a preoperative assessment with nuclear medicine is necessary. Uh, you might change your mind after the operation when you've got the surgeon's um, findings in the operation and the histology, but we don't do any preoperative scanning. Awesome. Thanks. All right, um, Greg, let's go ahead and look at yeah, the so you find it. We got, uh, I'll show you the image in a, in a second. The CT scan showed um, diffuse calcifications in the enlarged thyroid, the 12 centimeter uh, group of matted nodes uh, on the right, uh, some le left neck nodes and uh, bilateral central compartment nodes. Uh, and, and the way we're thinking about this now, and I'd be interested in both Mark's uh, commentary on this is with neoadjuvant trials now, we, we think of like, where is this tumor going to beat me? That is, what is a potential R2 interface based on this imaging? Um, and so that is, where might I leave gross disease if I don't take something outside of the thyroid? That's very helpful for me as I summarize the CAT scan findings. And so here, it looked to me like the right RLN, the right trachea, right straps, and that was in terms of potential R2 interfaces relative to the primary in the right thyroid. And then where might this large nodal mass give me problems with an R2 interface? And that was SCM, jugular, and vertebral artery. And you know, so SCM, no problem at all. Jugular vein, no problem at all. Vertebral artery, that's an issue. Um, so I think this is a, a helpful way of looking at it. I'll show you the images in a second. In terms of ultrasound, I, I was trying to force the discussion that we've already had and we obtained it and it added nothing. Um, chest CT scan Y, we did get that. And uh, as Mark outlined, I mean, the mediastinum I think is well evaluated by our neck CAT scan. Mary Beth Kinane does a great job with that, but it's really, you wanna get more of a robust local regional evaluation. Lori always appreciates this information with the patient coming in. Maybe she can comment on yeah. What, what What is this information important for her to have right out of the gate? But before you move on, I really like this concept of R2 interface. Um, now, most of the endocrinologists and most of us deal with, T, we know TNM, but we don't know the R. Can you, can you say just a, in a second yeah, what so, you that R2? Uh, yeah, R0, resec these are the three types of resec surgical resections. R0 means all tumor macroscopic and microscopic has been resected. R1 means all gross disease has been resected, but there's a microscopic positive margin. And R2 means there's, you cut across gross disease. There's gross disease left in the neck. So you're trying to make that decision up front. Is it, these are areas that you would potentially have to leave gross disease, which would be- or, or configure a surgery that would encompass that R2 interface. Like where are the extrathyroidal extension frontiers? possibly based on imaging. And, you know, with a good forensic evaluation of your imaging, you can do this. Okay, so let's let's look at his imaging and then look at the molecular testing because somebody's already mentioned sort of neoadjuvant stuff. And then let's go from there. So what are we looking so this at? Is, this is the lateral neck node. So, you know, in general, and I'd be interested in Mark uh, Erkin and Zafario uh, commenting on, you know, generally these are pushing nodes. They're keeping everything away. You can often dissect them away from even a, jugular vein that's uh, strapped, uh, splayed over them. But you see in the coronal images, you see this is not the simple straightforward set of nodes. There's a finger of these of this group of matted nodes that is extending lateral to the subclavian common carotid bifurcation and then a, a finger of, of disease that is extending uh, you know, into the central neck. And that's where I thought the vertebral artery was being abutted by this tumor. Um, this is not a typical pattern of extension, but when tumor starts to extend dorsally in the neck base, you have to think about things like phrenic 
and vertebral artery that you typically don't have to worry about for routine thyroid nodal distribution. This also kind of uh, helps to confuse the nomenclature of the neck locations, central versus lateral, because the nodal disease is not in any way respecting that. It's jumping the fence and extending. This is all one group of nodes that will bring you from the lateral neck into the central neck. I'll show uh, these are the other sets of images here with the pulmonary images. And so then uh, we uh, did not automatically bring her to surgery because of that long list of potential R2 interfaces. Uh, and so a test was ordered and that would be the next step, but I'll stop for a discussion of imaging, Mike. Dr. Worth, come in here for me for a second. So the, normally, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about molecular testing and somatic testing. You know, normally, you, it's a long ways down the road to get you involved in it. But now, what's the setting in this pre-op thing we should be thinking about the molecular testing, Lori? Well, exactly a case like this, although this case is so dramatic, um, it's kind of a no brainer. But I think that idea of, of, you know, when the when the surgeon is going to be leaving R2 disease behind, I think we're getting to the point where we might want to um, begin doing something about that in the neoadjuvant setting. Then also, this woman is only 26 years old, I'd be um, jumping all over Greg to do a core needle biopsy so that we could do uh, molecular testing. And um, and I'd be particularly excited about the potential for finding an actionable fusion in this young adult. So the pediatric and young adult patients um, with PTC are much more likely to harbor RET fusions and TREC fusions. We even see ALK fusions and rarely uh, ROS1 fusions. Um, so you can't do that molecular test testing well off of an FNA, um, and a core needle biopsy in this patient would be quite easy to do. It's definitely the right next step to see if we can identify something actionable. I just want to comment on something subtly that Lori said, which relates in part to something that Moxiferio implied, that as you get a multidisciplinary evaluation of this, like I've learned from Peter, learned from Lori, so we're dealing with a young patient. You know, you think about solid variant, you think about pediatric kind of uh, areas like Mark was implying. And, and so then with Peter and Lori's input, you start to think about this could be a fusion patient, you know, like this is something that you kind of seeing the headlights come down you on the road, but this is really an idea that is generated by a group of people really focused on this, a multidisciplinary group. All right, let's show, let's show Lori the somatic testing and then we'll come to Mark to see how he's gonna use that. And that is exactly what we did. We brought together the group in our uh, Mass General Mass Eye Near Advanced Thyroid Cancer Clinic that Lori and Peter participate in and a core biopsy was done. Um, and uh, this is the fusion. Uh, what I know about this fusion, you could fit on the head of a pin comfortably. Uh, and so I'll let Peter or Lori uh, comment on this. If in doubt, always go to Lori. Lori? So you, you ordered the test. Is this is this what you were looking for? Or I told you, you so. I told you so. <laughs> Actually, I mean, obviously, I know the patient. Yeah, but, so yeah but this is exactly what we'd be um, thinking about. And um, so the RET PT, uh, this is a RET PTC1 in the older nomenclature fusion or a CCDC6 RET gene fusion. Um, this is the most common RET um, gene fusion that we see. So the CCDC6 is the five prime fusion partner to the, the RET um, part of the gene that contains the intracellular business end or kinase domain of, of RET. And this fusion leads to constitutive activation of the RET kinase. So that's a, a driver alteration. And because it's a, an oncogenic kinase, it should be druggable. Um, so several years ago, there were a couple of drugs that were designed to potently and specifically inhibit the activated RET kinases um, that can be activated by these gene fusions and papillary thyroid cancer, also in a small subset of non-small cell lung carcinomas, uh, and then also the drugs um, were designed to inhibit the RET mutations that we see in medullary thyroid cancer. Perfect. Okay, uh, Greg, in the interest of time, take me through the clinical course and then stop once you get the surgery done, and then we'll have uh, Mark comment on his experience with this as well. Very good. So patient was started on selpercatinib, one of the two new RET uh, inhibitor agents. Uh, she uh, basically uh, tolerated this one pill a day incredibly well. In fact, when I said, so how was the medicine? She goes, well, the minute I took it, it started shrinking down my neck disease. And I said, so 
what about the complications were there problems with this she goes well to be honest with you i didn't know i was on the medicine they told me right before surgery that my liver function test went up a little bit but um i didn't really know that i was on the medicine so this was incredibly well tolerated this is the before and after coronal images that she uh had after four months on neoadjuvant cell percatinib. No more R2 interface in the SCM, just in terms of the nodal mass, no more R2 interface with the jugular vein, no more R2 interface with the vertebral artery. So this you know, improves my mood considerably as I bring this young woman to the OR. And again, this is the, you, know, you still have nodal disease, but uh, this is the result. Uh, we divide sometimes for more complicated patients, we'll stage the surgery. So she had initially a, a right lateral neck dissection. These are the images that you see there. And then followed by a total thyroidectomy, the right neck dissection showed 10 of 37 nodes. Peter will talk about the path in just a second. We have some images. And then the total thyroidectomy showed this to be right lobe, about five centimeters, diffuse sclerosing, uh, eight of 46 nodes in the central and left lateral neck. Uh, and these nodes just at surgery, the, uh, and Mark can probably, Mark Zaffaro can comment on this, but these nodes, when we dissected them, looked like someone had taken a baseball bat to them. They were shrunken and kind of hemorrhagic, and they looked kind of beat up. There was some mild desmoplastic reaction around them, but not ponderous, but they had clearly shrunken. There was this rind of desmoplastic reaction around them, but not too, too difficult to dissect, but the nodes themselves looked kind of hemorrhagic and beat up. Um, and so again, the pathology confirmed what we knew based on the core. And Peter, I'll go through these slides as you tell me to here. Yep. Hold on this a second is... for me. Uh, hold, before we do the path, yep. uh, uh, Dr. Saverio, give me, give me sort of some 30,000 feet observations here. So this is cell per catnib. It's a red fusion. How, how long do you generally leave these folks on before you take them to surgery? How much shrinkage do you want to see before you take them to surgery? Just from a, from a you know, practical standpoint, Mark. Thanks, Mike. So, um, yeah, this is a classic, uh, great example of a, uh, a very, um, I think, wise use of uh, neoadjuvant um, RET um, specific inhibitor, sulpercatinib in this case. Um, and um, yeah, we, we do have a trial looking at this where um, RET altered thyroid cancers and, and uh, we've enrolled about 14 patients on that trial, most of which are medullaries, but there's been about four RET fusion patients um, we've enrolled in that trial. And they've all been patients like this who, who were um, essentially patients in their 20s, um, have a pediatric type um, thyroid cancer presentation with bulky, uh, lymphadenopathy, um, uh, often, you know, little lung nodules, and they end up having a, a RET fusion. And I, I completely agree with, with Greg. It, you know, from that imaging, it appears that certainly um, neoadjuvant therapy could help with the R2 interfaces, especially, you know, often, as, as I think Dr. Randolph mentioned, often these are pushing margins um, in these types of patients, but you really don't know until you get in there. And the last thing you want is to, to be in a situation where you have to leave gross disease on the, you know, recurrent nerve or the vertebral artery or, or somewhere like that. And so I think this is a great example of, of how um, the R2 interfaces can sort of dictate um, uh, neoadjuvant therapy. In terms of the, the timing, um, in the trial, we typically um, leave patients on for a maximum of six months. I don't think there's any, we have any good data. Um, you tip, but you, as, as Dr. Randolph mentioned, in this case, you, you, typically do see responses in the first month or two. Um, and what I've sort of noticed is, is that the, the responses are the most dramatic in the first couple of months, and then they tend to sort of level off, you know, after that in months three, four, five, and six in terms of the trial. So I think you're, you're, you're at least going to want to leave patients on for two or three months. Um, and, you know, we, we leave them on up to six months. The other uh, minor point to make is we've had quite a few patients, um, um, although these drugs are pretty well tolerated, um, the issues that we've typically seen and had to dose reduce is due to a lot of patients do have fatigue, um, and that's a very common um, complaint um, on the on the RET inhibitor. Um, certainly, the, the increased LFTs were mentioned, and then the other thing that we've seen in a couple of patients is some pancytopenia that we've had to, to dose reduce for. So, those are a few um, highlights. Mike, can I just make a comment? Because I've spoken a lot to Mark and also to your colleague. Uh, Rich Wong, both of whom I respect 
quite a bit about neoadjuvant and how we think about it. And I think for the endocrinologists and oncologists, we're thinking like, so we can shrink the tumor down. So what, what would be the outcomes of this? Like, what are we really trying to do? You know, one would be to say, we will do the same surgery we would have otherwise done, but with neoadjuvant therapy, we may get a better margin. That's goal number one. Num goal number two would be, this is an aspirational goal, we may or may not see this, that we may not need to resect that thing that is representing the R2 interface, and, you know, trachea, esophagus, and I think that will be borne out. Nerve, I'm not so sure about. Nerve is linear and kind of gets gummed up in the tumor, and that often will still need to come, but trachea and esophagus, I got a feeling we may end up resecting less of those uh, in some circumstances, depending on the degree of invasion that the patient presents with, you know, uh, surface adherence, transmural invasion, there are different degrees, so. Yeah, Mike, one, one quick word of caution. I've had two cases now with neoadjuvant therapy where had a great response and on treatment, um, the patient, I, I missed a window and the patient started to progress on treatment. Uh, so just, just uh, uh, we're still in the nascent stage of this, but just a word of caution. Very good. Okay, so we're running a little bit long here. I want to look at the slides from Peter, because we're going to talk about adjuvant therapy at several journal clubs going ahead. Um, all right, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pop right through them, Mike. So, so just, this, this is a lymph node. I, I just wanted to give people the relative lay of the land that the, where, where you see those arrows, those blue circles with the purple in the middle, those are germinal centers, which allows us to know it's a lymph node. The asterisk represents where you have viable carcinoma. You'll see some, um, some fluffy stuff in the bottom right and white, which those are papillae of metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma, or you can see architecturally. And then the giant N in the middle is necrosis. And this is actually a response to the drug. Next slide, Greg. This is higher power. And um, you can just see those areas more closely. Next one, Greg. This is what I want to show you. This is actually in the thyroid proper. This is diffuse sclerosing variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And I wanted to point out to everyone, just so you can get a great, you know, perfect view of it. Those, those pink bands are what is called sclerosis. Oftentimes there's actually no nodule seen at all in the thyroid because the, the thyroid's diffusely involved, you don't see a mass. So you could look, look and see a normal thyroid and then actually see lymphadenopathy, especially in young, uh, young patients. So the, the one thing that actually we could diagnose the the fusion based on looking at the slide without actually even needing molecular diagnostics. And the reason we can do that is all those tiny little microcalcifications that you see, which are represented here by me before I became exhausted, the yellow arrowheads are all pointing toward the calcifications, but there's many, many more. And, um, and, and so that's these micro somoma bodies, tiny little calcifications are diagnostic of diffuse sclerosing variant and further CCDC6 uh, ret fusion. So this is, this is actually a diagnostic um, look at this. So next slide, Greg. And this is one sort of small papillary area that's left over. And then next slide. Um, this is what I wanted to point out is that you have these, these areas that are kind of interspersed within normal thyroid. So that's why I say it's sometimes very difficult to even see a, a proper mass because it is spread evenly throughout the, throughout the thyroid. And then next slide. And the, the other thing I want to point out is this is not typical changes that you see in papillary thyroid carcinoma in terms of the nuclei. They're more round, there are fewer grooves, there are, no, there are barely any intranuclear pseudo-inclusions. This has a different morphology to the tumor. And so although we call them papillary thyroid carcinomas, it really isn't. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's, it's a very specific tumor that's very distinct from what your classic papillary thyroid carcinoma would look like. And like I said, um, as we learn more about the genetics, uh, as well as the morphology of these tumors, we're able to actually say, by the way, the genetics are going to be this because this is what the morphology of the tumor looks like. This is the architecture of the tumor. And although it's still currently classified as, as we speak as a papillary thyroid carcinoma, I honestly feel by the next edition of WHO, we're going to be classifying these tumors in a different way. Okay, I think that should be it for me, Greg. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Lori, that's an Lori, Lori finish this one out for me and Monica. Uh, I go to Monica first. So we've used the Suppercat nib as neoadjuvant. They've done the surgery there. You know, is there any, should we leave them on the Suppercat nib to try to do the radioactive iodine scan? You know, is a redifferentiation thing I mean, we're kind of way out there, but Monica, what are, what are you sort of thinking about that? If you see one of these that has been treated this way? Well, I haven't actually seen any treated this way, but I'm, um, because uh, I would have thought diffuse sclerosing variant, you don't need to 
continue re-differentiation, but I see that you guys did. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I, I mean, I've had cases where we didn't have uptake in known METs and then we have done the re-differentiation in a lot older patients. And then we um, retreated when the scan showed uptake following re-differentiation. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was interesting that you kept her on the cell per catnib. Okay, Laurie, talk mm. about that just a, just a little bit because I'm going to see this exact patient, honest to God, at 10 o'clock this morning. Same case, same mutation, same diffuse sclerosing, cell per cat, and Dr. Convenient. Shaha whining about the surgery. <laughs> and I'm going to have to decide whether or not to leave him on for the radioactive iodine. So what do uh, I do? Convenient. Laurie? Well, so I think Monica makes a good point that a young patient like this should be responsive to radio iodine. So why do you need it? One of the reasons that we did it was because we knew that she had um, the structural distant metastases and because she tolerated sulpercatinib so well, it was a known entity. And we knew that she wouldn't have any difficulty if we gave her sulpercatinib leading into the, the radioactive iodine treatment. Um, the, the, that fusion does activate the MAP kinase cascade, and so it, it may indeed downregulate the, um, uh, the um, thyroid differentiation genes, TPO, uh, the sodium iodine symporter expression. Um, and there have been a couple of case reports published now um, in uh, patients with RET fusion positive iodine refractory disease showing that pretreatment with sulpercatinib does bring about um, uptake of radioactive iodine. Um, so that was the rationale for uh, her treatment. And um, so far, she's doing quite well. That's good for her. So I mean, I think that the teaching points in this case is, is the imaging when we have all that bulky disease up front, um, making sure we're doing the adult surgery, recognizing that you do, th that this may not be an easy surgery and shrinkage would help with that, which would lead us down the molecular testing the, the ideas of using a neoadjuvant and then still that opening, if they're on the drug already, can you just go ahead and do the radioactive iodine uh, while they're on drugs? So I think those are good. Um, Greg, how about if I do a player trade for you? Let's, let's do case number three, because I, I want to be able to okay. talk about case number three. Can I just have you pop ahead? Uh, I, I, can I just scroll through the case? Yeah, just scroll through. Three? Yeah. Yeah, because I think this, one, this one's a challenging case and a little bit different. Yeah. All right, let's look at this one. Okay, so this is a case of purple cell carcinoma recurrence. And so a uh, 66-year-old who presented with here with recurrent purple cell carcinoma, her initial uh, history started uh, back at Hopkins, and um, this was uh, an, uh, no other past medical history, right lobectomy at an outside institution. This was described as a, a right lobectomy. Uh, it was described as a purple cell adenoma and a microcarcinoma. In follow-up then, um, a number of years later, a new right ipsilateral paratracheal mass was identified. Uh, needle biopsy was done of that recurrent ipsilateral mass and it showed herthal cells. And so the patient went from that outside right lobectomy with ipsilateral bed recurrence to Hopkins had CT scanning there. The mass was then 5.3 centimeters with nodes. Again, a little disconnect, the past history was benign herthal cell adenoma, at least by history. So Peter, now at Hopkins with recurrence. Yeah, Peter, help me out here. So this is metastatic herthal cell adenoma or what's what's going on here? That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm giving the pathologist the benefit of the doubt. Come on, I, I, you uh, know. Peter, well, it's, it's a leading question. Don't you get it? <laughs> yes. So, so, so no, it, 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 in some ways it is. And we actually talk about this in other diseases in the head and neck. We talk about benign metastasizing, for instance, in women, benign metastasizing lyomyoma. We talk about benign metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma. These are tumors that have a very bland appearance that look exactly like the original lesion in the, in the, in the organ, but they metastasize and they look like, for all intents and purposes, you're taking it out of the, the thigh of the skin and it looks like a thyroid nodule. Um, so, 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 you know, this, this is, this is, this is what we get. This, this is what we get with a really well differentiated tumor. So I, I think the answer to your question is yes. And yet, no. Okay. okay go ahead. Well, Greg. that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we didn't give him the slides and he didn't charge for that. So you get what you right. get. All right, go for it, Greg. <laughs> so, uh, this is the continued history at Hopkins. So now the patient right lobectomy, right bed recurrence. Uh, uh, and so then at Hopkins, had a revision right central neck dissection. Uh, what they planned wasn't exactly clear, but 
they did have loss of signal LOS on the right from the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so they only did the right side. Pathology from that right central neck dissection with vocal cord paralysis was metastatic crocal cell carcinoma, uh, several foci in, in the central neck. And they also actually found several at that time subcutaneous nodules uh, at that time. There were some problems with the surgery. There was vocal cord paralysis. There was a pneumothorax that occurred. And so the patient was taken back for bronchoscopy and neck exploration. Turns out at that exploration, uh, the next day, there were um, uh, uh, four pneumothorax. Uh, there was an additional excision of subcutaneous nodules. So the bottom line is complex surgery with proven recurrence in the right bed. And at that time, at least two subcutaneous nodules identified at that revision surgery. Dr. Um, Erkin, Dr. Erkin help, me, help me think through this just a little bit. We, we've presented Herthel cells at these tumor boards. It's usually Dr. Worth involved with distant mets and lung mets and bone mets, and sometimes, you know, big recurrences in the TE group. <laughs> I, this subcutaneous nodule stuff, I, I, help me sort of, what is that, Mark? And, and how does that sort of frame how you think about the case? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of remembering a case that, um, uh, that we talked about in this forum several tumor boards ago. And I think it's just, we have to, uh, we have to think about this as most likely metastatic disease rather than some uh, surgical implant. I, I have to believe that that's entirely unlikely. And so I think the fact that it has uh, presented in this way has to be a consideration of uh, a local metastatic disease. Uh, Monica, let me come to you. On the first case, we weren't doing a lot of upfront or nuclear medicine imaging in the world. In this Herthel cell cancer setting, where, where are you with like nuclear medicine imaging and PET scan? And how's that going to help us here, Monica? Well, um, in an aggressive uh, case like this, PET scan may be useful in assessing ex assess uh, extent of disease because this has um, been proven to be an aggressive disease in this particular patient. So I, I think it may be useful in this patient. Laurie, a question came up on the last case. I think it's pertinent to this case. Is in these ones that look are more aggressive or growing more rapidly, when do we need to think about imaging the brain or imaging bones and you know not just the neck and chest, right? So, what, what, how do you sort of think about that, Laurie? You know, as Monica was speaking uh, about the PET CT, I was thinking, yeah, I would definitely want to do that. Um, with this unusual distribution of disease, then you know anything is fair game, um, and um, and so you could pick up uh, unexpected sites of disease with a with a PET CT, no problem. And I, the brain MRI question is a great one. Um, in patients that have been enrolled in the the uh, uh, drug tr uh, cancer treatment clinical trials with advanced DTC. Um, in the last decade, we're seeing about a 10% rate of brain metastasis in these patients. And so I, th that I think is an underappreciated fact. And I think that really doing brain MRIs in patients with iodine refractory DTC should be more of a default um, um, in our initial workup uh, of these patients. Yeah, I agree completely, Lori. I was, I was embarrassed many times when we first got these TKs and you guys would image and we'd find asymptomatic brain that I knew were there for a long time. So I routinely do on these aggressive ones, the bone mets, the lung mets one, you know, not, I don't know what sequent interval I do it, but as part of that initial staging. Um, Eric, Eric, how are you sort of, in this case, sort of, what, what are you thinking about now? This is, it's a herthal cell cancer. We're still in the neck. It's coming back. If you're talking to the family, sort of, what, what do you think is going to happen here sequence wise? You know, I, I guess I'm thinking to myself, it's still local right now. We don't have evidence of distant disease, I think, from best I've seen, uh, though I'd be worried about that. And you're kind of getting into a scenario here where um, it continues to come back locally, at least, but repeatedly. And so you're going to be thinking, how can you stop that? Is what, what would be the process to try and abate that? Um, you know, maybe a question to Monica as well, which is, is there always, is there any utility in ever thinking about radioactive iodine, acknowledging that herthal cell carcinomas are felt to be iodine resistant, but um, you know, there's probably a little harm also to a single dose. Um, I would be curious how you think about that, Monica. Well, um, I agree. In general, herthal cell is said not to be great 
uh, in you know, getting it a response to radioactive iodine, but uh, we would give it, we would give at least one dose, but um, she's still got her left lobe of thyroid in. I know Dr. Randolph has written about giving radioactive iodine with the, uh, half the thyroid in, but we prefer to have the whole thyroid out before we gave ra radioactive iodine. Dr. Saverio, um, somebody taught me one time thyroid cancer was always a surgical disease and we should always let you guys have the chance to cure it and that sort of stuff. Um, when do you start thinking about maybe the role for external beam radiation in somebody like this? You know, how many recurrences? You know, you didn't do the first surgery, so maybe you do a better surgery. So where, where are you sort of thinking about the role for external beam radiation as we're thinking about a difficult case like this? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Tuttle. So I think just broadly speaking, and, and a lot of these ideas have already been mentioned, but, you know, this type of, this is a particular pattern of um, sort of metastatic, uh, local, regionally aggressive Herkel cell cancer that we see biologically aggressive disease, whether it's, you know, related to you know, metastasis through the blood, the lymphatics, whether it's some type of seeding, but they get these sort of little tiny little tumor nodules that are diffuse in the soft tissues of the neck. And I always counsel patients, you know, when I see this, that it's not really um, a surgically curable disease. It does not mean that surgery does not have a role. I definitely think surgery has a very important role here, but it's very important to counsel the patients up front that this, I can take out all these little spots that I can see. And oftentimes you get in there and you'll see other little tiny little one to two millimeter nodules in there in the soft tissues that you couldn't even appreciate on a CT or a PET. I do think the PET is very important here because I think that with all this scar tissue in the neck, sometimes the PET can uh, help you appreciate little small nodules. But I think I think it's very important in these cases in these patients to look at the long term gain. So this patient has had this disease for a long time. She's 66 years old. So your goal is really to get her to 76, 86, 90 with the least amount of morbidity. And I think you start to look at you know how often you're having to do surgery. So you know, last surgery was in 2017, you know, perhaps you're about to do another surgery in, in 2022. That's a five-year interval. So I wouldn't pull the trigger on radiation at this point. I would say I would do it. I would do a surgery. I would clean her out and then I would wait and see. I mean, she's going to have disease that pops up elsewhere in the coming years, but your goal is to get her to sort of outlive the disease and with, with the minimum amount of morbidity. And I would, I would not pull the trigger on radiation at this point. Dr. Mike, can I just ask a question of the, of you and the group is that one of the reasons I thought this case would be interesting is this is a unique, as Mark described, uh, kind of a, a, a type of pattern of recurrence. It's really within the platysma muscle. These are really strap. It's it's not really sub. It's it's in the platysma. It's in the SCM. It's in the it's intramuscular is really what it is. It happens to be subcutaneous when it's affecting the platysma, but it's a really muscle tropic kind of thing. And and I struggle with the idea because, you know, you brought up brain metastasis. I think probably the reason you thought about that is that that's a normal thought to think whenever you have a subdermal met, a true subdermal met, because then hematologic lymphatic trains have jumped the tracks. It could be on the tip of your nose, great toe, brain, whatever. But this is an um, intramuscular, local, regional, very strange recurrence. I haven't seen any muscular recurrences in other parts of the body. And so uh, that I, I wanted a, to have a discussion of is this or isn't this different than what we typically regard as a subdermal met, which is a really bad prognostic thing for most entities. Yeah, a anecdotally, because I've never let the lack of data slow me down whatsoever. Um, anecdotally on ones like these, I, I haven't generally seen them explode out into lungs and bones, even though I've followed some of these guys for five or 10 years, it, it, which made me wonder whether it's, I don't know whether it's a metastasis or direct invasion, maybe it's lymphatics. Some of these are like, you know, right, you just don't see them in other parts of the skin. It's the area where we were operating and where the tumor was. So I think it's a local phenomenon. I always worry about these guys. I image them all over. And, and I mean, I've only seen half a dozen of these, so it's not a bunch of them, but, you know, they haven't done that explosive two-year, five-year course where they met out all over the body. Um, I don't know, Laura, you, have you guys seen these? What, I mean, we may as well do anecdotes while we're here since we don't have a thousand cases. What, what are you thinking, Laurie? Oh, I really don't have anything further yeah. to add. I think um, it is such a rare yeah. situation. And, and the ones you've seen, Mark, I mean, the, the general pattern has been local control and then recurrence back in other areas in the muscle and the skin three years later, five years later, but not like widespread distant mats, at least early on. 
Yeah, I think um, I, I yeah I agree exactly with what you're saying. I think typically um, you see that you continued local regional recurrence. Eventually, some of these patients do often have distant disease, but it doesn't tend to be this fast growing distant disease that you know is uh, immediately life threatening. So I think um, again, I don't think surgery 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 is curative here, but I think surgery has a role in sort of just controlling the disease and delaying, you know, the treatment with other, you know, therapies such as systemic therapy and radiation. Yeah. And I think you can see why, why we're going to look for distant meds. We probably don't expect to find it. And that's why we're so focused on this local control. So go ahead and Greg, Greg, tell us where we, where we are on the case now. Hey, so Mike, basically, yeah, let me, I'm sorry, go ahead. Two, two quick questions. Um, I, once that left lobe is out and she had, goes on to get her next recurrence, would um, would Monica want to do a test whole body scan to assess uh, radioactive iodine sensitivity um, before doing addressing recurrent disease? And and a follow up question to Mark Safario: What would he need to see in order to pull the trigger on external beam? What where would he this lady need to get to to? to make I think uh, having been off operated on by expert thyroid surgeon, I'd be happy to give an empiric dose of uh, radioactive iodine in this setting and not do a, a pre-treatment um, iodine scan um, because uh, I think it's reasonable to offer her one dose of radioactive iodine. It may or may not work. And I don't think a, a pre-treatment scan would alter my decision to give it or not. So before, before we come to Mark Severio, Greg Randolph, um, what if I made the case that doing that left, left lobectomy is more likely to harm this lady um, than the effectiveness of radioactive iodine? She's got a right cord out already, right cord's already out, right? So we're, yes. we're talking about, you know, you know I guess it, it's probably different if you do this every day of your life and you're the king of recurrent laryngeal nerves. But if this is being operated on in a, in a regular place where most of these people get operated on, what you're trying to balance is not radioactive iodine is not harmful, but a lobectomy could either damage this lady's nerve or she doesn't really get a lobectomy because everybody's so afraid of the nerve. How do you, how do you balance that in this sort of- Yeah, situation? absolutely. That is a very significant concern. And so that's why I took uh, comfort in the multidisciplinary decision-making that we took. Part of the driver here was this patient that even though we explained to her, look, this is not a subdermal met, the, your disease is not exploding. That was a hard argument to proffer towards this patient because her eyes were getting wider and wider every time she felt another nodule in her neck. She wasn't liking that. And she's fairly healthy, 60 year old. And she did want, as Mark had said, to get to 80 or 90. And so she was fairly motivated. And we did feel that RAI was something that should be offered to her. And um, in this setting, the morbidity of a completion thyroidectomy was uh, you know, uh, stated as, you know, potentially the source of a tracheotomy tube, and she knew that. Uh, but we discussed all together that we thought that having the information, interrogating it from the molecular point of view, and then offering her potentially RAI afterwards was a potential end game that would allow her to kind of get back on the road and stop having recurrences uh, every two to three years. Dr. Alexandria, this this is a nice discussion, but there's no way on on this planet radioactive iodine is going to help this lady, right? You know, I, well, I sort of put out there, frankly, there's no prospective comparative trial, right? And there's there's also kind of no clear data saying that it's uh, negative as well. Yeah. We know it has a low yield, and you just always are asking yourself, what's the smallest fraction of meaningful uptake that could perhaps make a meaningful clinical. Uh, you know, next step um, important, and we don't know, but but we've had seven. I mean, just to kind of put the radio back, iodine back on the table, I, I'm not I'm not saying I'm advocating it for it in any way in all herpes cell carcinomas. I totally get that, but you do have a track record of 70 years of use, and you know it's actually quite a safe thing, and it's likely not going to slow down anything else. So it still is out there in the kind of clinical opportunity landscape. Also, uh, Mike, just to answer your question of you know, looking for detours away from surgery, there was nodularity in this lobe. So this was not like a 30 millicure lobar yeah. ablation candidate. Also, there were two, in addition to the subcutaneous nodules, there were two central neck nodes that were macroscopic, clinically apparent disease. So there was, it, we felt a need for surgery um, 
uh, because of that reason. Yeah, and I, I think, yeah, I mean, what we're talking about here is a risk benefit ratio, right? What, what are the risks of the surgery? We understand it's unlikely for this tumor to grab on radioactive iodine, but if it did, that would potentially be a game changer, right? So, so sometimes- Yeah, and this is to the surgeons in the audience, this is something that we don't take lightly. And I never uh, operate on anyone like this unless I've met them for at least three separate appointments at length, one of which was this multidisciplinary visit so that they know like, I'm not really crazy about doing this either. It, there are some problems. There's definitely some brick walls here, and we got to think about that. The reason for doing it is this, this, and this. The downside is this, and let's think about it. But this is not the sort of patient that you push a consent form at when you first meet them. You build a relationship, and then generally with time, they see that you're thinking carefully and in a sober way about them, and they reach out to you and say, I want to have the surgery. Right, and, and, and I'll, I'll come to Mark Pacifario here now. The, I mean, I mean that's really the key, right? The key is when we have that discussion is radioactive iodine. It's not just no big deal. Or to, you know, we give you a little more dry mouth, or they need external beam radiation, but no big deal. It's like, but for us to say that, that means that lobe has to be something done with it. So, Mark, Mark, where sort of think through this with me as we're sort of thinking out loud about this risk benefit ratio and how you, you know, honestly just present that to the patient. So I think the, the que is the question with regard to external beam radiation therapy. Yeah. So where, yeah. where, yeah, where, do, where, eventually, you know, where, where do you, where do you draw the line at some point? Yeah. So I, I, I really look at two factors primarily, and it's really the rapidity of the recurrence. So, you yeah. know, when was their last surgery? You know, was it a year ago or was it five years ago? So that's the first question. How fast is this disease growing? And then the location of the disease. Okay, is this disease that's, you know, just in the SCM and the platysma and subcutaneous um, where, you know, I feel like I can go back with another surgery and get that out pretty quickly? Or is this like disease that's in the soft tissues at the bilateral, you know, cricothyroid joints where the nerve is going into the joint, where that would be a, a situation where you may be, be more likely to consider, you know, radiation therapy if you didn't think you could do another surgery. I think the other, you know, reason why, you know, we, we don't always pull the trigger, we don't generally pull the trigger with radiation therapy for these is because there's other options. I mean, in addition to surgery, you know, if, if especially if the tumor is slow growing enough, you know, this patient's 66, there's also drug therapy options down the road, you know, it, it, they could be tried. So these patients typically don't have uh, really targetable mutations, but um, there's certainly um, sort of the general linbatinib and, and, and those types of drugs could be used in the future to sort of keep disease at bay um, and, uh, you know, avoiding uh, sort of the acute toxicity of radiation therapy. So those are, those are a couple of thoughts. Awesome. Greg, let's uh, show, do, do the- Yes, do the we'll the move here. through the yep. surgery. So uh, ultrasound again showed basically some scattered nodes in the neck, including in the right central neck uh, and left central neck, um, the subcutaneous nodules, and then an intact left lobe. Uh, this was uh, the, the right neck uh, nodule, fairly small. This is in the side that is paralyzed. I thought if everything went well with the left, I can go to the right. The bridge is already burnt, no problem. That was not easy to get to, actually. It was quite scarred and, and under the carotid, and, um, but we were able to get that. And then uh, this is uh, showing the coronal left images show several of the subcutaneous nodules. These were really you look at them, they look like they are on the strap muscles. They were basically in the platysma. Uh, they could be felt. And as Mike, you said, these were like a string of pearls right along the scar. It's why that happens. You know, I mean, well, you know, if you manipulate tumor, so yeah. do you seed the body? Is there some stickiness of the Herkel cell hematologic metastasis that we create by doing a surgery and squeezing the tumor that somehow sticks to the musculature local regionally, I, but but that's what's happening. And and here are a couple of other pictures. Here, the left coronal panel is the um, one of the central neck nodes. And Mark uh, Zafario and Mark Erkin, I know you look at a lot of CAT scans with a lot of neck nodes. This looks a little peculiar for thyroid cancer, right? It looks a little roundish. It looks a little fluffy. Doesn't look so angry, but it's too big, right? And that's exactly the morphology at surgery. It was this maroon colored, beefy, fleshy, like liver, but- Greg, more we have about fried. two minutes left, so get to me. 
Okay, yeah, here we Move go. Move on. So, um, so I just wanted to show you, this is, the, uh, this is what the thyroid looks like. It's a multi-nodular thyroid to begin with. And none of these nodules are particularly hurtful. I have a high power view here where you see these dark navy blue nuclei uh, and small micro follicles. All right, next slide. This is the, um, the central neck. And I just wanted to show you this central neck because what you can see is on the top left is, is a metastasis because you can see a lymphoid rim around it and then the other negative lymph nodes that are there. So this is a legit metastasis to the central neck. Next, the, these, are, these are the subcutaneous nodules that are present there. This high power view just shows you that normal Herthel cells. This is a normal Herthel cell lesion, which brings back the tetaloid question of the subcutaneous things. Is it a benign adenoma? So you know, there, and this is the issue that will then bring in Laurie as the, as the go-to is like, what the hell do you do with this? The reason why Laurie is the Herthel cell professor of uh, oncology is because of the fact that here and at, at Memorial, we are trying very, very hard to understand the molecular genetics of these Herthel cell tumors because they're not the classic genetics of other thyroid cancers that we can think about targeting for drugs. They're very, very rich in mitochondria, which is the reason why they're particularly hy um, hypoxia sensitive. So the idea that these benign nodules appear in other parts of the body is absolutely curious to me because if you put a needle in it, it can completely die because of the hypoxia that you're inducing. So and they're really, really strange nodules. Sometimes they have HRAS mutations, but the truth is we, we start seeing they have the oxidative phosphorylation issues. They've got all sorts of things and they're completely different than any other tumor, which is reminiscent of the fact that my colleague who Bill Fakeman who sits next door to me had a case that he saw in 2011. And then, you know, six years later, the patient had a contralateral Herthel cell lesion that metastasized to lymph nodes and got a call from our good friends in Philadelphia who said, oh, I looked at your case from 2011, and that's Herthel cell cancer too, but it's not. They all, these benign appearing things that don't look like anything, no necrosis, no nothing. So, um, you know, how do we even say? So that's the reason why you want to know your pathologists are completely paranoid about misdiagnosing a Herthel cell carcinoma because they look like these benign things that you're finding underneath the skin. So how do you actually make the diagnosis of cancer? We need molecular markers that we don't have and we need molecular therapies that we don't have. So Laurie, why don't you close us out and tell us what the hell to do? Well, I'd consider external brain radiation <laughs> because we, uh, we don't have good drugs for these Herthel cell carcinomas yet, but I think we will be getting there. Um, as you mentioned, Peter, you know, they're, it's a very unique entity. These are not subsets of follicular thyroid cancers. Um, there's really unique molecular biology. Um, the Memorial Group and our group took a look at um, what drives Herthel cell carcinomas, and we found characteristic mitochondrial DNA mutations in a large portion of these um, cancers um, that are all concentrated in um, the complex one of the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. Um, there are other mutations that have been found as well. Another really interesting thing is that we found um, a widespread chromosomal loss in, in Herthel cell thyroid cancers. Um, so we've been able to develop now um, some cell lines um, and animal models. Um, also, uh, David McFadden at UT Southwestern is working on, on these models, and we're uh, working on developing drugs that can um, leverage, you know, these unique molecular drivers of, of, of uh, Herthel cell carcinoma. Not quite there yet, though. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. All righty, team, we've, we've come to the end of the hour. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for and your team for putting these cases together. Really, I think, important things for us as a multidisciplinary community to think through, right? How our decisions in endocrine impact surgery, how the surgical decisions impact medical oncology and, and nuclear medicine and radiology. So thanks so much for thinking out loud and thanks for working through these challenging cases with us. And we'll see everybody back at the next tumor board. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Bye. Nice to see everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Greg. Bye. Thank you.